Good afternoon. Welcome to the Akakik Foundation's first virtual Zoom presentation of Juneteenth, Journey to Freedom. I'm your host, Shamika Berry. Before we begin, there are a few key points I would like to make to ensure that the Zoom presentation runs smoothly as this is our very first one. The Zoom presentation will be recorded. In the upper right hand corner, if you could please change your gallery view to speaker view if you have not already done so and put your phone or your computer device on mute. There is a chat box where you will be able to ask your questions and my co-moderators and tech support will be on hand to answer questions referencing the Akakik Foundation that might not be directly related to Juneteenth itself. We have a very large number of attendees that are presently in the room and that we are expecting. If your question is not asked and responded to on camera, we do have your contact information and we will be responding to your question via email later. Once the presentation has concluded, we will go into the question and answer session. The Akakik Foundation proudly presents Juneteenth, Journey to Freedom. Welcome. I'm Shamika Berry, the Interpretation Coordinator at the Akakik Foundation on the sacred homeland of the Piscataway people. Juneteenth is a celebration of freedom. In the next few videos, you will meet a woman from 1770 and a family from 1870. So sit back, relax, and welcome to Juneteenth, Journey to Freedom. I remember the first time mama said that we were slaves. I asked her why we were picking the tobacco and she said that that's what slaves do. I didn't understand what it was to be a slave, but I knew that we had no choice to say, I don't want to do this. Mama always said, never say I don't want to. Always say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I don't think I really understood what it was to be a slave until I was taken from my mama when mistress married Master Bolton. And then I really understood when my son was sold away. All I want is for my son to be free I know I might not ever get any freedom, but I know it's possible. My husband, Tom, is free. He comes and goes as he pleases. He even gets paid for his work. That's what I want for my son. It's what I hope for all of us one day, to be able to earn our own money, make our own way, own our own homes for our hands and our feet to do what we would want them to do. I hope one day that that, that freedom comes. I have hope for it. My husband says that there's a great many of us that are free up in Baltimore and one day if I get my freedom, I hope to go up there and meet them. But as a mother, you always want better for your child than, than what you have for yourself. So my first thought is for Jack to get his freedom.
Thomas been able to see him. Jack's been gone for about five years now, but I hear he's doing well. I just, I just pray that one day things change. And that my son gets his freedom. That I get mine and can join him and my husband. And that one day, only God knows when. Maybe it won't be this way always. And we'll all get to taste, taste freedom. tree somewhere working on their lessons. Oof. Oh, it might have feels good to be able to say they're working on their lessons. When I was their age, I wasn't allowed to learn how to read nor write. But now we're free. And they have the right to get schooling. They have the right to things that I could have never imagined when I was their age. Six years we've been freed now here in Maryland. And this show is a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Now I've been married for some time and the girls are, well, I love them like they're my own, even though they're really my nieces. Their mama was sold away Shortly before we was all freed, it seemed like masters everywhere were selling off their slaves. They were so afraid of losing money by them being free, they wanted to get something. And so they've been, they've been mine for a while. And I'm married. You know, it feels good to be able to be in this house and to rent this land. My mama told me that many, many years ago, my great, great, great grandfather was a slave here on this land, but he was sold away when he was young. And now, when my husband found out that this land was able to be rented and we could live in this house, it was like a dream come true for my family. I'll never forget the day he said he was going to change his name and he was going to be Freeman because he was now a free man. And I'm a free woman. And it never, it never stops sounding good to my ears to say that I'm free. To be able to have our own place, to earn our own money, it was something that my ancestors could have never imagined. I'm sure they hoped for it and prayed for it and, and longed for it. But now it's truth. They tell us that President Lincoln signed it in 1863, but didn't mean nothing for us till 1864. Six years now being free. I prayed on nothing, make us go back to that terrible dark time. But now, I'm enjoying my family, work hard for them, and keep on encouraging my girls. We always want better for the generations that come after us. And I know that their future is brighter than I could have ever hoped for and dreamed. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed our presentation of Juneteenth, Journey to Freedom. 
Kate Sharper was a real woman who was enslaved in the 1700s in this area. We tell stories about her life to honor her and to respect the fact that she was a real woman. Elsie Freeman was a character that we created to represent the newly freed slaves after the Civil War. President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, but the slaves in Maryland were not covered because Maryland was a border state. In 1864, Maryland adopted a new constitution that emancipated those slaves. It wasn't until June 19, 1865, that the enslaved people in Texas were notified of their freedom. In the year 2014, the state of Maryland officially recognized Juneteenth. We thank you for joining us for our presentation, and we hope that you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much. The first Africans were brought to this land in 1619 and enslaved. Racial inequality has been a part of this nation from the very beginning, and we are still seeing the effects of it today, over 400 years later in 2020. Whenever another life is lost, we say their names to acknowledge their lives and presence in the lives of those who love them. I say the names of our ancestors for the same reason. Kate Sharper was brought to this land when she was actually, was actually, actually, actually a little name and that she had a son in our records. Because her last name is different from the names of the families in the area who owned this land, we have reason to believe that she was married to a free man. Now we have taken stories from slave narratives in our research and combined them with Kate's name to create a fully realized story that is historically plausible. We do this to honor those ancestors whose names have been lost in time and those whose stories have been lost to history. Slavery is an ugly part of our history, but it must be discussed. It is not a four letter word and we cannot learn from it if we do not talk about it. If we do not know our history, we cannot understand the significance of what has changed and what has not changed. We must learn from it and continue to press forward. I started doing historical interpretation because as my children were growing up, the only president that they were truly aware of prior to this current administration was President Obama. For them, that was the norm. And they would never have understood how extraordinary it was that he was our first African-American president if they didn't understand where some of their ancestors came from and how they came to this country. The Akakik Foundation supports racial equality and brings people together to embrace difficult conversations, to honor one another and our stories, and to work toward a more just world. If you are interested in the Foundation's full statement, you can find it on our website. Now, we will begin the question and answer portion. As I stated before, you are welcome to post your questions in the chat and they will be read and then answered. Also, as a reminder, this video will be posted later. So if there was any portion that you missed or if you joined the presentation, once the video started, you will have access to see the video in its entirety. Um, someone asked, uh, what other states were informed of their freedom after the initial Emancipation Proclamation was signed? So there was a question of what other states were informed after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. As I mentioned in the conclusion, 
the border states were not included in the Emancipation Proclamation. So that was Maryland, Delaware, counties in Virginia that became West Virginia and Tennessee and Kentucky. Texas was the last Confederate state to be notified. And it was on June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, which is why Juneteenth came to be. There are some other states that, depending on where they were in the Union, some celebrate in August and some celebrate in May. Next question is from Jonathan who said, what is the significance of gratitude for Juneteenth? Thank you, Jonathan. The question is, what is the significance of red food for Juneteenth? Red um, signifies the blood that was shed. And so to honor those who have been lost and to remember the ancestors, that is why red is a color in the flag, as well as a lot of the celebration colors that we use. Some people use streamers, some use banners. Um, you may make a red velvet cake. Barbecue is a very um, popular dish to be served. Juneteenth is a, it's our Independence Day. So the same way that many people around the country celebrate July 4th is how June 19th is celebrated and recognized with music, celebrating with family and friends, wonderful food, and just enjoying the fact that despite the hardships that our ancestors went through, that we have the opportunity to have a better life. Things are by no means perfect, but it is a way to acknowledge that that time was past. Tori is wondering why it took so long for the message to travel to Texas. Thank you for your question, Tori. The question is why did it take so long for the message to travel to Texas? Well, it was, eight, it was the 1800s. There was no internet, there were no cars. So news had to travel by word of mouth, by officials traveling with their horses or carriages. And it just took a very long time for everybody to get the information. It took longer than it should have. The information should have been, I would imagine, should have been sent out a lot sooner. I don't know if there were political holdups or just the climate of the times and the mode of transportation and the way that communication was passed around. Um, Samuel would like to say, great presentation. You mentioned the Akaki Foundation promotes conversations. What forums do you have uh, and events where we can participate in those conversations? Thank you for the question, Sam. The question is because I mentioned that Akakik supports having difficult conversations and what other platforms do we embrace and give those opportunities. Last year, we started the Land and River series where we have people from the community and the public that come together to discuss how can we talk about history, learn from history and promote a better environment for our communities. And once the pandemic has passed, we will have more opportunities through social media and hopefully through in-person conversations and presentations to continue on those conversations. If you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our website, you will be able to see when those announcements are made for when those conversations and conferences are able to be opened up again. Thank you. Mary would like to know if there are any recommended books or resources for teaching young children more about Juneteenth. Thank you, Mary. The question is, are there any other resources to teach young children about Juneteenth? Um, your local libraries, once the pandemic is over. I don't know of any, I don't know off the top of my head, any books that are written specifically geared towards children, but your local bookstores may have more information. I was taught about Juneteenth from my mother when I was seven years old. She's from Texas. And so it was a part of her history growing up that she was taught about. Not everybody knows about Juneteenth, but finding out what you can and breaking it down to their level 
and just explaining, first of all, what slavery was, how it was wrong, why it was wrong, and how it was abolished, we'll start the conversation. Um, we will do research to find out if there are any specific children's books that directly address Juneteenth, and we have your contact information. I'll be happy to email that to you. Pam would like to know, after COVID, do we have any field trips or day trips that we're going to have? Thank you for your question, Pam. The question is, once the pandemic is over, will there be any field trips or tours available for school-aged children and the general public? We are working on how to continue our education programming once the pandemic is over. However, we have found that our virtual content is also has been very welcomed and wide received all across the nation. So we will be continuing that as well. Some of the school field trips will be dependent upon the school systems and what they will be allowed and not allowed to do. But the site is open. We are planning to have staff members on site once we are able to interact again with the public fully so that we will be able to answer questions of the historical nature about this area. But please stay tuned to our social media as we are opening up more and as we gather more information from the school systems in the area about our field trip opportunities. Um, Anita would like to know if there are any songs commemorating Juneteenth. I don't know if, thank you Anita for the question about if there are any songs that reference Juneteenth specifically. I don't know of any. I do know that we have Lift Every Voice and Sing, which is the Black National Anthem. And we will do more research to find out if there are specific songs directly related to Juneteenth and get that information back to you. I've not grown up knowing any specific songs, so if anybody knows offhand, you're welcome to post that in the chat if you do know. Uh, John would like to know if the state of Maryland plans to I do not know. Thank you for your question about if there are any plans for it to become an official holiday in Maryland. I don't know if a bill is being presented or being passed. I know that in 2014, they did recognize that Juneteenth should be acknowledged and commemorated. But as far as there being a bill to make it an official either state holiday or if there's one for it to become a national holiday, I do not know. I will do research and make sure that that information is presented to you. Um, Tori says, the Confederates in Texas did not want to free the slaves, but were made to on Juneteenth. Is this why there is such disdain in the African-American population for the Confederate flag? The question, thank you, Tori, for your question. The question was because the Texas Confederacy did not want to release the slaves until June 19th. Is that why there is so much animosity between the African-American community and the Confederate flag? The Confederate flag represents a time of slavery. And it represents the racial tensions. It represents hatred. It represents fear. And that is why the Confederate flag is why there's a lot of animosity towards the Confederate flag. It was the flag that the Confederacy used to represent them and what they stood for, and they wanted to keep people of African descent in bondage. So was it because of the Juneteenth aspect of it or the slaves specifically in Texas? To me, it's not. It is completely, my opinion, my belief, is it represents the entire Confederacy, not just one state. And that is why seeing the Confederate flag is very difficult for people in the African-American community. 
Okay. Uh, Nikki would like to know, why do you think Juneteenth has gained so much traction lately and that some governors are recognizing it as a holiday? And how do we keep this traction moving forward? Thank you for your question, Nikki. The question was, is the current climate of the times the reason why Juneteenth has gained so much traction? I think with the current social media and the way information is spread out instantaneously, that people who were not previously aware of Juneteenth have learned more about it. People in the South, and especially in Texas, have known about Juneteenth most of their lives. So for us, it is not a new concept, but I know for many people, they're just now hearing about it. The, a lot of what is happening in the, in the nation today has made people more aware of things that previously were either ignored or that they could look away from or because it didn't affect them, it wasn't something that they thought about. But something can happen in one state and within 20 minutes, the nation can be aware of it because of the news and social media. We need to continue having conversations. We need to educate each other, educate our families and friends, talk to those who may not want to listen because they need to listen. If you are an ally, talk to your families and friends. Some, some of you within the presentation will be able to reach people that I will never be able to reach. I might not ever meet them or they may not ever see anything, any presentations that I ever give or any of my historical interpretations. But if you share what you have learned today, if you share what you have learned in any part of your walk of life, then the education will spread. And that is how we continue the momentum. Too often we react to what we see. And then when the next issue comes up, we react to that issue. And then the next issue comes up and we react to that issue. What we need to remember is not to forget what we have previously been talking about because another issue has been raised. Communication is key to keep the momentum going so that everyone can learn and understand the importance of expanding our horizons, expanding our mind and showing love and compassion to our fellow human beings. Laura um, Thomas says, my girls wanted to know which states were first to know about the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, thank you for the question about which states were the first to know about the Emancipation Proclamation. I will actually have to get back to you because I do not want to misspeak and name states that were not immediately known or not name states that were immediately known, but we do have your contact information and I will send that to you as soon as possible. Jonathan asks, With each state, get progressively smaller. This creates necks in the tubes. We ask you to please mute your phones or your devices if you have not done so. Thank you. Do we have evidence that the white masters in Texas knew that slaves were free? The question is, do we have evidence that the white masters knew that the slaves were free? We'll, we will never be able to know who all actually knew prior to the last slaves being notified in Galveston. It's possible that there were some slave masters who knew that the Emancipation Proclamation had come out and that their slaves were freed, but kept that information to themselves to continue keeping their slaves in bondage. There's no way to fully know who knew and who did not know. We just have the knowledge that on June 19th, everybody was finally notified. And it's very possible that there were still people afterwards who were not notified until much later, but that's when the official proclamation was brought by the Major General. Terry asks if you will have another one woman show coming up, <laughs> showcasing other women of color or perhaps a virtual show. Um, the Akakik Foundation is planning other virtual programming in the future. And 
in reference to any projects that I am working on, you can follow my social media and get the information on that when it is ready to be presented. Thank you. Uh, Julius says, now that Juneteenth is an official holiday other than protests and voting, how can we address and abolish systematic racism? Thank you, Javius, for your question. The question is, how can we continue to abolish systematic racism? Education, communication, having allies that are not Blacks or Indigenous people of color, sharing what they have learned. There are people who are not racist, who can reach people who are, who can educate them talk to them, explain to them how their thinking is flawed, how their thinking is wrong, and how we need to look at our fellow human beings as fellow human beings. There's no way to see each other without seeing our color, but the difference is to see and recognize and understand the experiences that people who are different from you must go through, but not judging them for with preconceived notions about how you think they act based upon their appearance. I had a conversation recently with somebody where they used the term judging someone by the color of their skin. And we don't need to judge people by the color of their skin, but we do need to see them because if you do not see the full person then you don't understand where they're coming from. You don't understand the hardships and the experiences that they've had in their lives. So see each other, hear each other, and express that to your family, friends, colleagues, to see and hear one another. Don't judge each other, but it is important to see each other. And that is a very clear difference. I hope that answered your question. One question was when those in slavery were made aware of their freedom, how did they transition without land or houses of their own? That is an excellent question. The question is for those, the enslaved who were freed, how did they navigate this new world where they were freed but did not have any money, did not have any homes, and did not have any education or skills beyond what they had grown up doing their entire lives. There were reformations, there were groups that were formed to help those that had previously been enslaved and newly freed navigate this new world. As, I, as you saw in the video, there were people who were freed in the 1700s. There were people who were freed in the 1800s. And the education that they had, the knowledge that they had Many of them formed groups to educate the ones who didn't know. If you are sent out into the world and you've never had any experience of earning money, managing money, buying or renting land, building your own home, living on your own, it's a very frightening experience. You saw the fictional character of Elsie who was excited at the, the idea that her girls could learn. She was excited about the freedom that she had. She was excited about the freedom and the opportunities that her girls would have in the future, but it was by no means easy. Many people stayed on the plantations that they were previously enslaved upon to continue to do work there. They earned a small wage because they were freed, but there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of the unknown and for some of them staying close to where they spent their entire lives was easier for them than to try to go out completely into the world separated from anything that they knew if they had grown up being enslaved on a tobacco farm they knew about tobacco they may not be able to start their own harvest but they were able to continue to work on what they did know and build their lives from there. That is why we had the character of Elsie 
come back to this land so that she had the chance to have a new life, but it was still an environment that she was familiar with. I hope that answers your question. Um, somebody asked, what was your research process for crafting these women's stories? The question was, what was my research process for crafting these women's stories? As I said before, within our our records and our archives here at the Akaki Foundation, we do know that the owner of Kate Sharper in his will, he left her and her son as part of his inventory to his family. But that is all we know about Kate Sharper. We have one line, Kate Sharper and one child. And because that is all we know about her, we say her name because she's not in any history books in fact, if you Google Kate Sharper, my picture, just as Kate Sharper, will come up. But we do have access, and you all can Google and get access to various slave narratives. There were many slaves in, who were in their senior years in the 30s who were interviewed, and they told their stories. Some of those stories, their names are not connected to them. And so we take those stories that we know happened, that we know people lived and experienced, and we put them together with either names that we know whose stories we don't have or names that we created so that we can create a fully realized person. Too often when you're reading in a history book, it may be one line, it may be erroneous information that might be sugar-coated to make it sound nicer. People who were enslaved might be referenced as laborers, which is not what they were. They were not laborers, they were not workers. They were enslaved human beings. And we want to show that they were real people. Just reading a name and a line or two in a history book does not, does not make you realize that it was a full person. It's just information that you take in and maybe remember for a test and then you forget afterwards. But if you see somebody telling the story, dressed in the clothing that they would have worn, you put a face with a name, with an experience, and it becomes more real. And that is the research that we went through to craft the stories of these women and the stories that we tell here at the Akakik Foundation. Any information about the transition from slavery to Jim Crow? Yeah. Um, that's from Anthony. Um, Anthony, thank you for your question about the transition from slavery to Jim Crow. There is a lot more information than we have for time allotted. Um, if you have a specific question, you can ask me, you can email me and I will get that answer back to you. But the slaves were emancipate, emancipated and freed and known of their freedom in 1865 and the Jim Crow laws were decades and decades and decades afterwards. So there was a lot of racial tension, a lot of discrimination that we even still see today. Um, there's, no, there's no clear line between emancipation and Jim Crow because there were still laws and rules in place to stop African-Americans from progressing and to keep them from being successful. And that is why it's important to know our history so that we know what to fight for. Civil rights movement was an amazing movement, but it must still continue today because if it was over, we wouldn't be fighting the same fights that we're still currently fighting. So a lot of people think that civil rights movement was in the past. They think that the Jim Crow laws were in the past, but sadly, a lot of those mindsets continue to go on even to 2020 as we see watching the news even then in the most recent weeks and we have a lot of work to do in this country to make sure that everybody has the equality that we all deserve as human beings mary asks what are your thoughts on questions white people should ask them while understanding racial biases thank you for your for your question mary the question is what are my thoughts on that last one again? 
on the questions that white people should ask themselves. That's a hard question to answer. I, I can't speak for white people. I would, I would say, ask yourself, would you want to have the same experiences that black people have been saying recently and for years what we've been going through. If you are driving in your vehicle and you see a cop car behind you, do you naturally tense up? If you are pulled over, are you afraid? Those are the types of conversations that black parents have with their children that we have amongst ourselves. I have a son and he will be 21 in September. And I've taught him since he was young the various precautions and steps that he needs to take if he finds himself in certain situations. Ask yourself, would you want to experience what black people have said they have had to experience? We all want to be treated with respect. We all want to be treated fairly. We all want to be treated humanely. And that is, that is from my heart. That is the only thing that I can say. Just ask yourself, is that how I would want to be treated? The thoughts that I'm having, the words that I'm hearing from other people, the conversations that I find myself pulled into, the jokes, the humor. Would I want those things said about me? Would I want to have those things said to me? And if you can say no, then that is the start of the conversation that should be had with other family members, friends, colleagues, those in your community. Nikki says, your costumes for both Kate and Elsie are beautiful and so specific. How did you design and construct each piece? Thank you, Nikki, for the questions about the costuming. A lot of research, finding the year and the, the era and the year of the characters being portrayed, finding out the type of work that they would be doing. Elsie would have just been a tenant farmer. It was 1870, so her, the style of dress would have been different. She may not have had the most modern in that time or the finest clothing because of her station in life, but she would have had the material. She would have had the knowledge to be able to sew and repair garments maybe that had been handed down to her or her mother or grandmother would have been able to teach her how to make garments. There were no markets to or stores or department stores for her to be able to purchase her finest dress. With Kate Sharper, the leather stay or the jumps that she's wearing, in today's landscape, leather can be very expensive. But in the 1700s, because people were primarily farmers and they had cows at their disposal, Leather was, was prevalent and was easy, easier to get. They did their own tanning. Um, also, because of the climate and the time of year and the heat, Kate would have been more allowed to wear her shift, which was the, the sleeves that you saw, which was actually her gown, and the leather stay because the, it gave the support that she would need for her back bending over doing the tobacco crops, the picking of the hornworms and fighting the flea beetles. Um, everybody would have worn aprons to protect their clothing for as much as possible. And laundry was a very, very difficult process. And so they took great care to take care of the little clothing that they did have. But a lot of research for the age range, the time period and the type of work that each character would do. We have another question about recommended reading fiction or nonfiction for adults specific to Juneteenth and the time period from Emancipation Proclamation until Juneteenth. What is recommended reading in general? Um, 
Thank you for the question about recommended reading for adults in reference to the Emancipation Proclamation into Juneteenth and about Juneteenth itself. I do not have a list of books that I would recommend, but I will do the research and we will make sure that that question is answered to you via email. I would want to make sure that that the books are reputable and are very specific to the questions that you are asking. So I don't want to just say something off the top of my head that would be incorrect or would not be good reading. So we will get that information to you very soon. Thank you. It is now 1250. We will give time for one or two more questions. I'm just looking to see if I missed anything. Okay. And for those of you who have post questions, thank you very much for your very thoughtful and thought provoking questions. And as I stated before, if your question was not read aloud, we do have your contact information. We will do the research and get that information to you as soon as possible. What is something you want people to take away from this experience, from Ricky? Thank you, Ricky, for your question. What do I want people to take away from this experience? I want you to remember that Kate Sharper is a real person. I want you to understand that we are all people. We are all humans. And yes, we have different appearances, different racial backgrounds, different ethnicities, different experiences, and different lives. But we all have a story to tell, and we are all in this world together. Treat each other with respect, the same respect that you would want to be treated with. You can't look at somebody and based upon their appearance, assume how they are going to be, judge them for what you think they are like. Get to know them, get to know each other, get to know the other members of your community. Unless we learn about each other and talk to each other, and communicate with each other. We won't be able to learn how to embrace each other. Look and think beyond everything that you think that you know, because none of us know everything. Continue to strive to learn and to grow and to help your fellow human being. That is what I would want everybody to take away from this, from this experience. Nikki says, with the pandemic, we've all been forced to go Zoom. Moving forward, will you offer more online? Thank you, Nikki, for your question. The pandemic has opened our eyes to a whole new virtual world. Prior to this, I, didn't, I was not very familiar with Zoom, and now it is almost a daily way of life. Um, the education programming team here at the Akakik Foundation are going to continue to present more programming virtually. We have reached more people during this pandemic than we thought possible. We have friends now from Maine to Alaska and all points in between. And so even as our site is able to open up in the future and we are able to do more on-site programming, we will continue our virtual programming because we have many friends now who through travel or life challenges will not be able to come down to our site to see what it is that we do. So we will be continuing virtual programming, hopefully more Zoom presentations, as well as on-site programming. Um, one more, um, Laura, she says, maybe you could send us a message for lack of time here, but my daughters want to know your personal experiences with racial profiling or prejudices in your own life. Thank you for the question, Laura. Um, due to the time that we have, I will send you a personal email to answer the question that you have about my personal experiences with possible racial profiling. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for participating in our Juneteenth Journey to Freedom virtual Zoom presentation. I 
appreciate your patience with the time delay starting and allowing all of our other visitors to join in with the programming. Your participation makes programming like this possible. Uh, we will be presenting additional museum theater opportunities in July to tell more stories about Kate Sharper and her family in our Sharper Family series. I ask that you please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our website for more information about how and when those events will be presented. Thank you all again so much for joining us today. If you celebrate it, happy Juneteenth. Thank you for coming and have a wonderful day.